Chad Franzen here, co-host for this show, where we feature top restaurateurs, investors, and business leaders. This is part of our Spot On. Hengum Stanfield is a mom of four, an electrical engineer, an immigrant from Iran, and the pizza lady at Matenga's Pizzeria. She and her husband, Matt, founded Matenga's in 2014 with zero restaurant experience, and they've increased their sales six times in the last eight years. They plan to open three more stores in the next three months. Hengum is the host of the Making Dough Show podcast, for which she shares their journey of being restaurant owners and how to own a restaurant that doesn't own you. Hangum, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you? Absolutely. I'm super excited to have this conversation with you. Hey, uh, before we get before we get into your restaurant, your podcast, tell me a little bit more about your background. You're an electrical engineer and you came from Iran. Yeah. And so I'm, uh, I'm an immigrant. I came to the U.S. about 14 years ago, but uh, I was born and raised in Iran. I also got to live in Spain for about eight years. Uh, I was studying telecommunication engineering there, and I was able to transfer uh, for college to New Mexico Tech and uh, got an electrical engineering there. And I met my husband, Matt. Uh, he is a civil engineer. Uh, we met there and uh, we got married and uh, we realized we wanted to be in business for one another because, I mean, obviously engineering is all fun, but you ultimately are just staring at a screen all day. and. Uh, we had spent so much time together during college. And once we went to work, we realized we barely see each other. And then when we come home, we were really exhausted. So we felt like we wanted to, and we loved hosting parties in our home and, you know, making fresh pasta, making all kinds of food. And we thought, you know, let's, uh, let's go open a restaurant. And we again had zero experience. So we want to get out of New Mexico uh, where we lived. It was a very, very small town, far from Albuquerque. Um, and or Santa Fe, all the uh, glamorous cities. And so we ended up moving to Texas. We really liked, we live in San Antonio area. And so that was about eight years ago. Um, back then we had two little children. And so one day to the next, you know, we sold our house in New Mexico and we bought this failing pizzeria again in the San Antonio area. So that is a short version of it. Wow. Uh We'll get more into Matangos and your pizzeria and everything. But first, tell me a little bit uh, about the uh, Making Dough Show podcast. How did that get started? Sure. So it was about a few years ago um, that I got a lot of questions about, you know, how we do our restaurants and how do we handle, you know, again, our family. And one of the things that we have, we found out our strength being is creating systems in our business, partly because of the background we have. And so I get to share uh, a lot of those things, you know, what it is that we're doing in our restaurants to make sure that we're running a profitable uh, business and all along not needing to be there all the time. That is kind of what one thing that we wanted to do that again, we have very young children and we couldn't afford to be at the store all the time. So that led into always on an ongoing basis asking where's the gap, what's the problem here? How can we create a system so we don't need to be there at opening, at closing, at um, because then you will have absolutely no life and you cannot really expand. So that was kind of our strength. And um, obviously we make a lot of dough in our pizzeria. So that went back to be the making dough show. So that's dough for obviously dough and money. So that's kind of how it came about. Sure, very nice. Hey, uh, what kind of systems do you have in place that ha allow you to have a restaurant that doesn't own you? Um, so, in every season of business, you need different systems. So I realized the first, I was back there washing dishes and I'm outstanding at it uh, or, making, or making pizzas. And no matter how fast and outstanding of a person I am in the kitchen, back then, again, when we started eight years ago, that was a $10 an hour job. And those were the ones that first I decided we, I need to get myself out of it. I found myself saying the same things over and over. Uh, when you do a lot of repeated tasks. And so I, whenever we hired people, I was training people. And so I'm making the time to be there early morning to train this new team member. And some of them stuck around for a year or two, some left in three weeks. And I realized I'm sacrificing time from my, you know, our children. And again, our kids were a year and a half. I'm almost seven months old. So they were really little. And so I'm sacrificing time to be here and training these individuals. And I need to have systems and that I don't need to do it all the time. So I started creating a lot of videos. So when I create, for example, a team member on the menu, I have them watch a video of me explaining the menu and the stuff. Or, and I edited those videos on iMovie. I went to the restaurant at 5 a.m. because I used to work regular operations. So 
I would go to the restaurant at 5 a.m., record those videos, onboarding videos. This is the vision and mission of our restaurant. And so I started from low t dollar tasks, systematizing those to get myself out of that area. And we just kind of, and we continue to create systems. As I said, your systems break in every level um, of, of business. So that's an ongoing process. So tell me a little bit about uh, Matango's Pizza. What can customers expect when they go there? Oh, wonderful. So uh, Matango's Pizzeria, my husband's name is Matt, and then and part of my name is Angus. And when I lived in Spain, nobody really could, could pronounce my full name. So they used to call me Angus. So that's uh, Matango's where it comes from. And so we uh, started in 2014. And between 2014 and 2018, we had the one location. We opened the second location uh, in 2018. And this year being the 2022, in January, we opened a location. Uh, May 4th, we opened the fifth location. And uh, we're opening two more locations in the next two weeks. And I can go about how that came about. But um, our restaurant, uh, family environment, great food, and uh, other things that sets us apart. We have like some ranch dips that are unique. We have a Matangas ranch that has like fresh garlic and basil in within the ranch. Uh, in Texas, people love ranch with their pizza. We have a um, a Texas ranch with jalapeno and cilantro with the ranch dip that goes very well with pizza, of course. We have a keto crust we make in-house with ground chicken and eggs and Parmesan cheese. Um, we have a lot of vegan offerings and so, and obviously gluten-free offerings. We wanted to make sure, we serve a lot of families with young kids and we wanted to make sure everybody enjoys pizza, no matter if you're on a diet, you're cutting back or you have, you know, allergies to whatever. It doesn't matter. We wanted to make sure we serve everybody pizza. So that is what we're about. We always have a train table in every restaurant. We're very family um, friendly environment. So that's what we love to do. What gave you the, uh, you said you, you, you guys enjoyed having people over or entertaining people or having parties or whatever, but that's a lot different than owning a restaurant. What kind of gave yes. you the, the confidence that this would be you know, something that would end up being a good idea? Um, I would say ignorance for one. We, I mean, we didn't, we didn't know what we were doing. And sometimes people, you hear that from some people, they enter in the business world and they look back and like, oh, I was always an entrepreneur. I don't know, you know, you hear some people say that. I, I wasn't one of them. I, I never thought we would be in business. We would ever succeed in business. That's not what I ever thought we would ever do. Um, we did not know what a restaurant business would entail at all. And once we got into it, again, we sold our house in New Mexico and we came here with a rental home. I mean, we had absolutely no other option. And you'd be surprised what you get to do when you are pressed to do it. You will find out what you're capable of. Even for example, when it comes to diets and stuff, it's hard to go on a diet. But if you're like, hey, you are you have liver cancer and if you don't stop eating sugar and gluten or something, you're gonna live, you know, you're gonna have six months to live. Well, we will do, I mean, you know what I mean? So. Pressure makes diamond is what I tell our team all the time as well. But that's how it came about that we didn't, we did not know that we were going to ever succeed in the restaurant. And you were right in terms of feeding people. The food is about 15% of the food business. The rest is all business is managing people, your finances, your marketing, um, a lot of vendor relationships. I mean, so much customer service, of course, a lot that goes into it, as you mentioned. How much would you say you know, you okay, compared to what you know now, when you started, what, what percentage of that would you say you knew then? Probably 3%. Oh, wow. We, we, I, I mean, I did not know how to cut a pizza. I mean, that was that bad. You know, like when you cut with a cutter and it still doesn't like fully cut, I mean, we did not know anything about the restaurant. I mean, we had never even worked as a dishwasher. A lot of people worked as servers, nothing at all. I mean, yeah. So, so given that, what were, the, what were kind of the, the early days, the early days like for Batangos and the early days like for you while working there? It was very, very hard. I mean, uh, I remember one once my husband and I we were and, and the, the restaurant we bought the we did not know how to read the P and L of course, and then when you buy a. Um, a business, it is on you to do your due diligence. The broker, it's a for-profit. They want to make money, of course, and the business person who's selling it, you know, they're, everybody's fighting for their own. And so we need to do our own due diligence. It's, uh, we didn't know how to do that, of course. And so all this is going to be a cash cow of a restaurant. It was probably, it was making about an average of 500,000 a year of this restaurant. And it was probably 150,000 below break even that that's what it was so we worked about 120 hours a week my parents also lived with us and 
they worked at the restaurant. One of us always was with the kids. And um, I mean, we, we were, we made no profits. Probably we made probably about $1,200 a month to pay for our rent. And the rest, we lived at the restaurant. We barely got get because we just came to the restaurant all day long. We were just there for about two years. We made no profits. It was very, very hard. I mean, I think I lost 25 pounds out of stress and, you know, being on your feet all day. Um, I remember vividly once being in, in the office with my husband thinking about how we're going to pay payroll. And it was like the bill was going to be $10,000 and it's Tuesday and it's going to be, ten, you know, on Thursday it was going to hit and we didn't have the money in the bank. And it's really different when you're, you know, like a regular person. Okay, we're going to cut back. We're not going to go out to eat or we're going to, when you have a $10,000 payroll that's going about to hit, I mean, it's not about saving here and there. It's about, a you know, growing sale. You need, you know what I mean? So it was, I'm not going to say it was easy and it's continuously as hard and challenging and it's well worth it. Um, it's just childbirth. It's very painful, but it's well worth it. You know, just part of that. Did you uh, did you use the the recipes that were already in place from the previous owners for the pizzas, or did you bring immediately things to the table in, uh, on that in that respect? So that one, I mean, there they were not written recipes systems documented anywhere. It was just this person would make it this way, that person would make it that way. It was a, a lot of hit and miss. My parents, they really assisted with that. I mean, every batch of, I mean, we've gone through our dough iterations, like, and with temperature in the summer, it needs to be a little bit different in the winter, it needs to be different. Um, so my folks really helped with our recipes in, in the beginning to get that going. Wow, amazing. So what kind of gave you some traction or what gave you the most results as you got started? So one of the things that happened, you know, within a few months, we realized the restaurant is empty most of the time and the staff has a great time. They're building fantastic relationships. They're having a great time at the, you know, staff, you know, they're, they're getting paid. So it doesn't matter. So we realized if we're just sitting at the restaurant waiting for customers to come, we have a Chick-fil-A in our parking lot. And my husband, I would just, I would be looking from our glass inside, looking out and I'd be like, what is, what are those people doing over there? I mean, we were empty most of the time. And then we realized, you know what, if we just sit at the restaurant and just wait, nothing's going to happen. So <laughs> we got that memo and we realized we need to be out there. So we have religiously taken food out and pizzas, complimentary pizzas out to businesses in a, like a two mile radius of our, uh, of our restaurant every single day for years. I mean, years we would hit five or six businesses every single day. My husband would take pizza. I would take pizza, shaking hands. You know, there was a parade in town. We'd be there. There was a grand open up. So we bring free food. I mean, we have given, I mean, like entering Caterpillar facility is all like locked up with security. We say, Hey, we're just a local pizzeria. We got some pizzas for y'all's staff. People would let us in and that you just need to make friends. You need to go out, meet people, shake hands, um, and be known this, the, the enemy of a small business is obscurity. You know, we open at the same time at Chick-fil-A. They run a great restaurant business. I have nothing against them and we're good friends with the owners. But the minute they open, average, you know, based on the news, I don't have the exact, but they're making like 40 million a year projected. Um, as soon as they open, we have to start from zero because we're obscure. You're a small business. Nobody knows you. Nobody needs you. Nobody needs another Mexican restaurant. Everybody or another pizzeria. Everybody's needs are taken. You know, you yourself, you probably already have your go-to pizza place, your go-to Mexican, your go-to Chinese, whatever. And a new restaurant opens, you have absolutely no reason to go there. You need to give people an incentive uh, to come try your food. You need to be, you know what I mean? So um, we had to learn that the hard way and we went incredibly aggressive and sales does cure a lot of problems in business. So I remember, I mean, my feet hurt. I mean, we were, I mean, hours and hours of working, which is very common in our industry. I mean, laying in bed next to my husband, you're so tired, you can't even sleep because you are that exhausted. And we were under a lot of pressure. And, but at least we're like, you know, I'm like exhausted and I'm in pain, but at least we got good sales today. That was just the one good thing. You know, we don't have staff, this person quit, this crash and burns, at least we had good sales. Literally, that will get you through. So that's the one thing you need to focus on. And that's what is the thing with making dough show. I feel like we need, we don't really, we need to focus on growing sales. With sales, everything else almost works itself out. You you can pay people more once you make more money. And when you can people pay, when you can pay more, you can get more applicants. It'll, everything will work itself out. I don't know if it makes sense. It's for the most part, you know what I mean? 
so things kind of started develop, to develop for you. When was the restaurant then? You said you were sitting there in the restaurant with the empty and you watched Chick-fil-A being full. When did that kind of, when did the tables kind of start to turn? I um, think it took about a year to, to get there, um, to, to get there. And it was like a January, we gradually, we, we've had 10 to 15% sales uh, increase since then for the last few years, even, you know, sometimes 20% sales growth. Uh, and also social media was different back then, um, if you recall, it was the times that you wanted people to like your Facebook page and stuff back then, it was 2014, because when you would post something, everybody would, everybody would see it. I don't know if you remember those times, those were good times. And um, I was listening to Gary Vee, I was listening to those, you know, we implemented a lot of those things and we, I'm happy we took advantage of social media then when we did, because now it's just different and you need to leverage things. It's just different than what it was. It still is effective, of course, but we were able to really reach uh, out to a lot of our customers via social media um, that worked as well. Very good for us then. So you've gotten to the point where when you, you've already gotten to the point where you uh, have expanded and you're ready to expand even further. Um, uh, what, what got you to that point? How did you know where you were at that point? And are you still really aggressive in terms of sales? Well, we're still very aggressive because there's so much is on the line. Um, you, when you invest a lot of money, especially with the expansion, we were like, my husband and I were talking about, he's like, okay, well, for the three restaurants, the sign is going to be $25,000. I've not even requested it. And when you, when you pay for it, it's going to be like 46 weeks. So we put a banner up. We ordered this huge banner and you put a wood frame around it. We have a banner up right now and we've bootstrapped everything throughout our career here and with the restaurant, but you got, you know, so there was a lot of money, uh, you know, the oven, oh, it's 20K here, 15K there, 10, you know, like we have currently have a lot of credit card debt as we open the other stores. Once we open them, they're projected to do well. They're in good areas and because we've done our due diligence and again, Lord willing, it'll work out, but it is, we're still very, very aggressive about sales because you have to, you have to be, so we can pay our people well. I am very passionate about that, but if you don't have sales, nobody gets paid. You know, it's just, um, so that is part of that, but we, it was a decision to make to, to expand for years. We wanted, uh, and that's the first thing, everybody who, you know, you work uh, for someone else, you have a job, then you're, you're want to be free. Everybody wants this freedom thing. Oh, you want to be free and you make money every month without needing to be there all the time. You know, that's this, this, uh, first thing that a lot of people want. That's why they enter into the business world. And once we were making kind of very low six figures, we re we started getting really bored and it was not very healthy for us as a business thing stagnant a little bit. That's in 2019. And we were, we were not at the restaurants much. We had the two store, we had managers. We were not really at the restaurants much. Uh, and we got really stagnant and, um, we decided to even, you know, sell the restaurants and somebody offered us a, a check for $540,000 for the two restaurants. And that's when we were like, okay, well, if we sell the restaurants, what are we going to do? You know? And then we realized, okay, well, we love food and we love business. So we would still be in food and in business. So, well, we already have this, what's the point of selling it? So it was actually a very um, good point for us to see clarity as to who we wanted to be. And we realized, you know, go big or go home, you know, we need to go all in. And so we have been, and obviously then soon after a pandemic hit and it was very challenging, I'm sure for everybody going through the pandemic, shortage of supplies, we didn't have staff, you know, all kinds of logistics that went into that but we were able to grow our sales like 20% through the, all the pandemic stuff and um, be bold enough to move forward. Uh, we were talking today, gas is probably gonna maybe hit $6 a gallon. That's gonna affect people's spendings. It's about four something where we're at right now in Texas. And that's gonna, you know, we're gonna have challenges hiring drivers. We're, these are, you know, but somebody's gotta grow and expand and it, it better be us. I mean, we, we have to, if you just shrink as the world is going crazy, you're going to just stay in your home and not do anything. I'm saying as a business, you have to go out and you need to take it. It's going to be difficult, but somebody has got to do it. So why not you? Why not me? Um, you know what I mean? So, yeah, you know, uh, the, you mentioned the price of a sign. Those are things that most average people, I guess, don't think about. You, you know, you oh, yes. a place, like, why does that place have such a crappy sign? Well, now we know, you know, it's very pricey, huh? 
It's very, very expensive. It's about 8,000 uh, per, per sign that goes up there. Um, and, and rent is very expensive. You know, we had to like renew our um, alcohol license. We sell beer and wine, 3,000. Bob Light's 2,000. I mean, it's just it, all the time. And you have to have savings. You have to, things break all the time. Oh, they left this there. Oh, this broke. Two thousand dollars. It's. I mean, I physically it aches my body when I. But you have. You know what I mean. It's just the cost of business, sadly. Sure, sure. So uh, you know, I have a lot of friends who uh, have engineering backgrounds and are. They no longer do engineering, but they say that their degrees and their experience help them because of their ability to solve problems. Would yes. You say that, that has been the case for you guys. Oh, absolutely. Um, and being objective when things get very emotional. Restaurant is a people business, and you have a lot of people involved, and being able to look at things in terms of process, where's a problem. Um, it has been ve very beneficial. And also it's been um, the other side of the coin that has been a little bit difficult is understanding that, for example, with us as engineers, we look for problems. We're trained to look for problems to go solve them. And that leads to not um, seeing the good that is going on. You, you, when you're always focused on the problem, you make it a little bit unbearable. People work with you because you're maybe they're doing 10 things right and they're doing two things wrong and you really focus on what's going wrong because that's what we're programmed to do. In the people business, you have to balance it out. You need to micromanage processes and you need to lead people. They're you know, kind of a two different things. And if you're always, again, if you look for problems, you will find it. You, you will find problems to solve on an ongoing basis. It's like weeds in the yard. I mean, they're always going to be weeds. They're growing everywhere, you know. Uh, but uh, it makes business fun. I feel like as an engineer, it transfers into doing business, especially when you're good with numbers, analytics. Business is all math after all. Um, so it lends to skill sets that applies to business uh, for sure. A couple more questions for you. How has Matengas developed as a brand? I know that uh, building a brand is one of your specialties. How would you say it's kind of evolved as a brand? Sure. I mean, as, as a brand, um, I would say that if somebody's in the first two years of their business and they're not profitable, they should not really worry about brand in the beginning because you need money first to, to hit break even and make profits. So you need to be focused on sales. But once you know you are in the profit zone and you're in the black, then uh, branding is a lot to do with who are you as, as you know, who do you want, who are the customers we want to enjoy? So I said, for example, families with young kids, because we have young children. So that's a demographic we know how to serve. I know how to market to moms. Maybe I'm not as good at marketing to college students or whatever, because that's not in the world I'm in right now, though I'm pretty good with that college because we lived a long time in college. But uh, vividly, I remember we had a another pizzeria, a local pizzeria in our town, and the couple owners, they are empty nesters. They have a lot of alcohol uh, focus, they have big screens for people to come watch sports, and their clients and customers are a lot of empty nesters. Great people, but you know, it's important to know who you are and what kind of a customers you want, So, and to be aligned with that. So branding wise, who we wanted to be known is that we wanted to be family owned. We wanted to, for people to know that we're, you know, generous because nobody loves to support a greedy business owner. So we want to highlight people in our community. We host two spirit nights fundraisers for schools and we donate 30% of sales generated back to the schools. We have great relationships with schools. Again, we donate pizzas or there's a teacher's thing going on. We give out a lot of those. That's part of our branding and sowing goodwill. Um, it's a big part of our business. It's not as just branding. It's a purpose of what we do. Uh, a business is nothing without community, particularly local business. I mean, I can't worry about what folks are doing in Colorado. We focus about the, the three to five mile radius of those that are around our restaurant. It, it's an, it's an advantage and disadvantage, of course, being a local business owner. So when you focus on the advantage, there's how many schools are here? How many churches are here? How many businesses are here? These are the hospitals. These are the this. And we need to be known by everybody and looking for ways to serve them. That has always um, worked for us. And that is part of our branding um, that we do. And we create a lot of commercials in-house for our uh, for Matengas. We involve our children. Um, our community people appreciate the hustle. People want, when you see a small business owner who hustles and bootstraps, people want to support that. So you want to tell those stories. I had a story of the banner when we put the banner up. We had to, 
go on the roof. I mean, it's us, you know, my kids are holding the things. I recorded a reel and I put it up everybody like just be, because people want to support, um, you know, they wish to everybody. I think at some point you want to be a small business owner. You want to work for yourself. Everybody has that dream, but people support that at least in our community. And we try to tell those stories. Uh, and that is all part of our brand as well. That's great. Sounds great. Yeah. Hey, what's one thing you would tell uh, somebody who wants to open their own restaurant that you know now that maybe you wish you knew back when you guys started? Um, I would say that that person, uh, if I could go back in time, I would say you must go and work at a restaurant uh, for at least three months to see if that is what you want to do. If somebody was to approach us as a restaurant owner and they're, for example, South San Antonio, they come, we're in North San Antonio and say, hey, I just want to like, I buy you all lunch or coffee, it doesn't matter. And I would like to just you know, talk to you about, you know, about the restaurant and whatever. We're happy to openly share. Point is, wherever this you are that you are watching or listening and you like to be in a restaurant business, go befriend a couple of restaurant owners. They may really bash the industry. What I'm saying is get a couple of successful restaurant owners that have not, that have been able to balance their family and grow their business. Not one that's not successful because they're going to tell you don't enter in, in this industry because it is hard. And yes, it is hard, but it is doable. If you are passionate about business and food, restaurant, there's nothing like it. I mean, there's nothing like the restaurant industry. And I think as things get hard, there's still people want to go to restaurants. So it is a very fun industry. And yes, it is very, very hard. Um, but if you can do it, uh, why not? So. I have one final question for you. Yes, sir. How can people find out more about Matengas? Sure. You know, obviously uh, our website, Matengas, which is M-A-T-T-E-N-G-A-S.com. That's our website and all the stuff we do on social. Uh, and Making Dough Show is just everywhere. Making Dough Show is on YouTube, on podcasts. It's makingdoughshow.com as well. Okay, great. Hey, uh, if you were to go to Matengas as a customer, what would be your kind of go-to item of choice? Oh my goodness. Uh, it would be our chicken pesto pizza. I love pesto and basil, of course, but uh, our Zeppoli donuts are very good. It's our pizza dough. We cut it and then we fry it and then we coat it with cinnamon sugar. That's, it's good to end the meal on a, on a sweet high note is always good. So those are my two choices. Okay. There. <laughs> very nice. I'm, I'm hungry now. Hey, uh, but, uh, hey, uh, hey guys, it's been great to talk to you. I really appreciate your time today. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.